Hello everyone, here we are. We're going to keep going now with Leviticus chapter 3. This is the third book of the Torah, the Jewish Bible, which is the books uh, of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, the Old Testament as we know it. Um, the first chapter, the first book was Genesis, then Exodus, and now we're in Leviticus. And this is going to show us some more laws and ways that God wants offerings brought to him. Okay, so here we go. Leviticus 3. If your offering is a fellowship offering, and you offer an animal from the herd, whether male or female, you're to present it before the Lord an animal without defect. That means no cleft palate, no uh, poor hair, you know, fur, no uh, crooked hoof, nothing. Perfect. You're to lay your hand on the head of your offering and slaughter it at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Then Aaron's sons, the priests, shall splash the blood against the sides of the altar. From the fellowship offering, you're to bring a food offering to the Lord, the internal organs and all the fat that's connected to them, both kidneys with the fat on them near the loins and the long lobe of the liver, which you'll remove with the kidneys. Now, I don't know what all these different organs mean, but they mean something to God. Then Aaron's sons are to burn it on the altar on top of the burnt offering that's lying on the burning wood. It's a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. If you offer an animal from the flock as a fellowship offering to the Lord, you're to offer a male or female without defect. If you offer a lamb, you're to present it before the Lord. Lay your hand on its head and slaughter it in front of the tent of meeting. Then Aaron's sons shall splash its blood against the sides of the altar from the fellowship offering. You're to bring a food offering to the Lord. It's fat, the entire fat tail cut off close to the backbone, the internal organs and all the fat that's connected to them, both the kidneys with the fat on them near the loins and the long lobe of the liver, which you'll remove with the kidneys. The priest shall burn them on the altar as a food offering presented to the Lord. If your offering is a goat, you're to present it before the Lord. Lay your hand on its head and slaughter it in front of the tent of meeting. Then Aaron's sons shall splash its blood against the sides of the altar. From what you offer, you're to present this food offering to the Lord. The internal organs and all the fat that is connected to them, both kidneys, both kidneys with the fat on them near the loins, and the long lobe of the liver, which you'll remove with the kidneys. <clears throat> Excuse me. The priest shall burn them on the altar as a food offering, a pleasing aroma. All the fat is the Lord's. This is a lasting ordinance from generation from for the generations to come wherever you live. You must not eat any fat or any blood. Okay, Leviticus 4. The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, when anyone sins unintentionally and does what is forbidden in any of the Lord's commands, mm -hmm. if the anointed priest sins, bringing guilt on the people, he must bring to the Lord a young bull without defect as a sin offering for the sin he's committed. He's to present the bull at the entrance to the tent of meeting before the Lord. Mm -hmm. He's to lay his hand on its head and slaughter it there before the Lord. Then the anointed priest shall take some of the bull's blood and carry it into the tent of meeting. He's to dip his finger into the blood and sprinkle some of it seven times before the Lord in front of the curtain of the sanctuary. The priest shall then put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of fragrant incense that's before the Lord in the tent of meeting. The rest of the bull's blood he'll pour, he shall pour out at the base of the altar of burnt offering at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Now, if you imagine all of this being done in silence, and you know, it is very holy because they're handling blood. Okay, so it wouldn't be like you'd be speaking up or making any kind of a ruckus, you know, emotionally, verbally. You know, this is all very holy. But you also, as you're putting your hand on that animal's head and slaughtering it, knowing that you're slaughtering it because of your sin, <clears throat> that would be difficult, okay? Um, he shall remove all the fat from the bull of the sin offering, all the fat that's connected to the internal organs, both kidneys with the fat on them near the loins and the long lobe of the liver, which he'll remove with the kidneys, just as the fat is removed from the ox, sacrificed as a fellowship offering. Then the priest shall burn them on the altar of burnt offering, but the hide of the bull and all its flesh, as well as the head and legs, the internal organs and the intestines, 
that is all the rest of the bull, he must take outside the camp to a place ceremonially clean where the ashes are thrown and burn it there in a wood fire on the ash heap. Now, I don't understand what God's thinking is because he's not explaining it to us, okay? If the whole Israelite community sins unintentionally and does what's forbidden in any of the Lord's commands, even though the community is unaware of the matter, when they realize their guilt and the sin they committed becomes known, the assembly must bring a young bull as a sin offering and present it before the tent of meeting. The elders of the community are to lay their hands on the bull's head before the Lord, and the bull should be slaughtered before the Lord. When the anointed priest is to take some, then the anointed priest is to take some of the bull's blood into the tent of meeting. He shall dip his finger into the blood and sprinkle it before the Lord seven times in front of the curtain. He is to put some of the blood on the horns of the altar that's before the Lord in the tent of meeting. The rest of the blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar of burnt offering at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He shall remove all the fat from it and burn it on the altar and do with this bull just as he did with the bull for the sin offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement for the community and they will be forgiven. Then he shall take the bull outside the camp and burn it as he burned the first bull. This is the sin offering for the community. When a leader sins unintentionally and does what is forbidden in any of the commands of the Lord his God, when he realizes his guilt and the sin he's committed becomes known, he must bring as his offering a male goat without defect. He's to lay his hand on the goat's head and slaughter it at the place where the burnt offering is slaughtered before the Lord. It's a sin offering. Then the priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and pour out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. He shall burn all the fat on the altar as he burned the fat of the fellowship offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement for the leader's sin and he will be forgiven. If any member of the community sins unintentionally and does what is forbidden in any of the Lord's commands, when they realize their guilt and the sin they've committed becomes known, they must bring as their offering for the sin they committed a female goat without defect. They're to lay their hand on the head of the sin offering and slaughter it at the place of burnt offering. Then the priest is to take some of the blood with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and pour out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. They shall remove all the fat, just as the fat is removed from the fellowship offering, and the priest shall burn it on the altar as an aroma pleasing to the Lord. In this way, the priest will make atonement for them, and they will be forgiven. If someone brings a lamb as their sin offering, they are to bring a female without defect. They are to lay their hand on its head and slaughter it for a sin offering at the place where the burnt offering is, sla is slaughtered. Then the priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and pour the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. They shall remove all the fat, just as the fat is removed from the lamb of the fellowship offering, and the priest shall burn it on the altar on top of the food offerings presented to the Lord. In this way, the priest will make atonement for them for the sin they've committed, and they will be forgiven. So this is the Lord explaining to them what sacrifices need to go for what sins. Otherwise, they wouldn't know. <clears throat> Leviticus 5. If anyone sins because they don't speak up when they hear a public charge to testify regarding something they've seen or learned about, they will be held responsible. So for instance, if you see a car accident and you see who was at fault and yet you don't speak up when they're calling to the public to come forward, you know, like if you've seen this accident at the corner of, you know, Bird Street and Animal Street, please come forward and let us know. If you refuse to do that, you're gonna be held responsible. That's what this means. Let me read it again. If anyone sins because they don't speak up when they hear a public charge to testify regarding something they've seen or learned about, they will be held responsible. If anyone becomes aware that they're guilty, if they unwittingly touch anything ceremonially unclean, whether the carcass of an unclean animal, wild or domestic, or of any unclean creature that moves along the ground, and they're unaware that they've become unclean, but then they come to realize their guilt, or if they touch human uncleanness, anything that would make them unclean, even though they're unaware of it, that could be like vomit, you know, somebody throws up, you're cleaning it up or whatever, 
uh, even though they're unaware of it, but then they learn of it and realize their guilt. Or if anyone thoughtlessly takes an oath to do anything, whether good or evil, in any matter one might carelessly swear about, even though they're unaware of it, but then they learn of it and realize their guilt. When anyone becomes aware that they're guilty in any of these matters, they must confess in what way they've sinned. As a penalty for the sin they've committed, they must bring to the Lord a female lamb or goat from the flock as a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for them for their sin. Now, it may be really difficult to have to bring a, a goat or a sheep or a bull. I mean, that's your livelihood is your flock. So having to pay a penalty by, you know, sacrificing a lamb or a sheep or a goat may be painful beyond the obvious of watching an animal die for your sin. <clears throat> Anyone who cannot afford a lamb is to bring two doves or two young pigeons to the Lord as a penalty for their sin, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. Let's just reiterate again. For some reason, blood is the payment for sin. I don't know why the Lord made it that way, but that's why we're hearing so much here about sacrifice and about the rules for the offerings and the penalties, okay? Because blood has to be given to cover sin. I don't know why that is, but we have such a holy God that that's what he needs. It's almost like a life for a life. Because we know that if we have unatoned for sin, i.e. the blood of Jesus Christ, we go to hell. There's no atonement for it once you've missed that opportunity. You just, you just go live in hell. Okay, so, so blood is the only thing that is the great equalizer, if you follow me. Because your life is in your blood, okay? That's where life exists, in the blood of any creature, Animal, human, we're animals too, although reasoning ones, but the life is in the blood, okay? So let's remember what we're doing here, and let's remember that the Lord we're serving, who has the power to bestow eternal life, is holy. And this is what he says has to be done. So it's getting done, okay? Whew. They are to bring them to the priest, the two pigeons, who shall first offer the one for the sin offering. He's to wring its head from its neck, not dividing it completely. That is so gross. I'm sorry. And is to splash some of the blood of the sin offering against the side of the altar. See, let's look at this as the ugliness of sin. It's like, oops, I sinned. And then you have to watch a bird have its head wrung off. That's a good picture of how awful sin is and how God can't be anywhere near it. So these are the penalties we have to pay to stay in God's presence. Now, it's not like that for us today, but this is the way it was for them. Thank God we have Jesus. Okay, he sat down, he said, it's finished. And then he sat down, it's done. No more burnt offerings, none of that, okay? Now they say in the very end, the Jews will start sacrificing again. But that's a whole other story, okay? And they, remember, they don't believe in Jesus, okay? Um, the rest of the blood must be drained out at the base of the altar. It's a sin offering. It's very serious. Somebody loses their life. Somebody lost their life for us, Jesus Christ, God. The priest shall then offer the other, as a, the other pigeon, as a burnt offering in the prescribed way and make atonement for them for the sin they've committed and they will be forgiven. To me, that's a big price. And I know it is to you too. And Jesus really paid a horrible price. Now do you get it? I mean, he was so tormented physically before they put him on that cross that it is absolutely worse than wringing the head off a bird. Sorry to the bird lovers, okay? But what Jesus went through was far more violent and far uglier, far more dramatic, far more painful than the instant death of a bird getting its head wrung, its neck wrung. Jesus had no such mercy. He went through every stripe of the beatings so let's keep this in perspective, okay? So in a way, this is the kinder, gentler way. It 
If, however, they can't afford two doves or two young pigeons, they're to bring an offering for their sin, a tenth of an ephah of the finest flour for a sin offering. They must not put olive oil or incense on it because it's a sin offering. So no, no precious odors involved in this sin offering. It is for sin. They are to bring it to the priest who shall take a handful of it as a memorial portion and burn it on the altar on top of the food offerings presented to the Lord. It's a sin offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement for them for any of these sins they've committed, and they will be forgiven. The rest of the offering will belong to the priest, as in the case of the grain offering. The Lord said to Moses, when anyone is unfaithful to the Lord by sinning unintentionally in regard to any of the Lord's holy things, they're to bring to the Lord as a penalty a ram from the flock, one without defect and of the proper value in silver according to the sanctuary shekel. It's a guilt offering. They must make restitution for what they failed to do in regard to the holy things. See, once again, an animal has to die for something we did wrong. Pay an additional penalty of a fifth of its value and give it all to the priest. The priest will make atonement for them with the ram as a guilt offering and they'll be forgiven. If anyone sins and does what is forbidden in any of the Lord's commands, even though they don't know it, they're guilty and will be held responsible. They are to bring to the priest as a guilt offering a ram from the flock. One Now a ram is the one that is siring more rams and lambs and ewes, okay? So losing a ram is painful, okay? So you're really paying a price for your sin, okay? This is the impetus to have the, the Israelites obey God, okay? He's making the punishment egregious to them, okay, or egregious so that people will mind their P's and Q's and obey God and listen to him. They are to bring to the priest as a guilt offering a ram from the flock, one without defect and of the proper value. In this way, the priest will make atonement for them for the wrong they've committed unintentionally, and they will be forgiven. It's a guilt offering. They've been guilty of wrongdoing against the Lord. Wow. Leviticus 6, and our last one for tonight. The Lord said to Moses, if anyone sins and is unfaithful to the Lord by deceiving a neighbor about something entrusted to them or left in their care or about something stolen or if they cheat their neighbor or if they find lost property and lie about it. Basically, this is stealing. You know, if you manipulate your neighbor about something that you have that's perhaps theirs and you do something with it and then you lie and say, well, I don't know what happened. Uh, if they or if they swear falsely about any such sin that people may commit, so lying for someone when you know something has gone wrong and lying for that person, when they sin in any of these ways and realize their guilt, they must return what they have stolen or taken by extortion or what was entrusted to them or the lost property they found or whatever it was they swore falsely about. So finders, keepers, losers, weepers does not work here. You return what you found, what you find, to the proper owner. Or whatever it was they swore falsely about, that they lied about. They must make restitution in full, add a fifth of the value to it, and give it all to the owner on the day they present their guilt offering. And as a penalty, they must bring to the priest, that is to the Lord, their guilt offering, a ram from the flock, one without defect and of the proper value. In this way, the priest will make atonement for them before the Lord, and they will be forgiven for any of the things they did that made them guilty. That's, that's, letting, that's making the ram take the punishment. Excuse me. You see what I'm saying? I mean, it's embarrassing to have to fess up. And it's, it's uh, maybe financially painful to have to give up your ram. But the one who's paying the price for you is the ram. So it's even still mercy. I mean, giving Jesus was the ultimate mercy, but this is also merciful. It's not them having to die, okay? The Lord said to Moses, give Aaron and his sons this command. These are the regulations for the burnt offering. The burnt offering is to remain on the altar hearth throughout the night till morning, and the fire must be kept burning on the altar. The priest, so that probably smelled really good right? It's like smell, the smell of cooking. And, you know, the Lord constantly talks about that aroma of food that is pleasing to him. 
So it would be kind of, I know this is a weird way to put it, but sometimes when, I was gonna say it's kind of cozy, because sometimes when I've made a really nice chicken in the oven, it makes the whole house just smell wonderful. And that smell will last maybe for hours. And it always, you know, I'll leave the house, come back in and smell it, and it's a good smell. So I understand what the Lord is saying. It's that pleasant uh, feeling of well-being, okay? Um, and the fire must be kept burning on the altar. The priest shall then put on his linen clothes with linen undergarments next to his body and shall remove the ashes of the burnt offering that the fires consumed on the altar and place them beside the altar. Then he's to take off these clothes and put on others and carry the ashes outside the camp to a place that's ceremonially clean. The fire on the altar must be kept burning. It must not go out. Every morning, the priest is to add firewood and arrange the burnt offering on the fire and burn the fat of the fellowship offerings on it. The fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. It must not go out. There, these are the regulations for the grain offering. Aaron's sons are to bring it before the Lord in front of the altar. The priest is to take a handful of the finest flour and some olive oil together with all the incense on the grain offering and burn the memorial portion on the altar as an aroma pleasing to the Lord. Aaron and his sons shall eat the rest of it, but it's to be eaten without yeast in the sanctuary area. They are to eat it in the courtyard of the tent of meeting. It must not be baked with yeast. I have given it as their share of the food offerings presented to me. Like the sin offering and the guilt offering, it is most holy. Any male descendant of Aaron may eat it. For all generations to come, it's his perpetual share of the food offerings presented to the Lord. Whatever touches them will become holy. Ah, uh, excuse me. The Lord also said to Moses, This is the offering Aaron and his sons are to bring to the Lord on the day he's anointed. A tenth of an ephah of the finest flour as a regular grain offering, half of it in the morning, half in the evening. It must be presented with oil on a griddle, bring it well mixed and present the grain offering broken in pieces as an aroma pleasing to the Lord. Now, if you go to my feed, you're gonna see pictures of everything we've been talking about. And I do have a picture of a grain offering and it's broken pieces of a flat bread. Um, the son who is uh, la 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 la. The son who is to succeed him as anointed priest shall prepare it, prepare the grain offering. It is the Lord's perpetual share and is to be burned completely. Every grain offering of a priest shall be burned completely. It must not be eaten. So they get a portion, but the rest of it is is burned. The Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron and his sons, these are the regulations for the sin offering. The sin offering is to be slaughtered before the Lord in the place the burnt offering is slaughtered. It is most holy. The priest who offers it shall eat it. It is to be eaten in the sanctuary area in the courtyard of the tent of meeting. Whatever touches any of the flesh will become holy. And if any of the blood splatter is splattered on a garment, you must wash it in the sanctuary area. The clay pot the meat is cooked in must be broken. But if it is cooked in a bronze pot, the pot's to be scoured and rinsed with water. So in other words, a clay pot would probably absorb things from the meat and just is never going to be truly clean again. But a bronze pot, you can scour and rinse with water. Any male in a priest's family may eat it. It is most holy. But any sin offering whose blood is brought into the tent of meeting to make atonement in the holy place must not be eaten. It must be burned up. Okay, so tomorrow we'll do Leviticus uh, 7. And I believe there are only 27 chapters in Leviticus. Okay, so after that we have Numbers or Deuteronomy. I think it's, I think it's Deuteronomy. Could be wrong. It's one of the two. And, um, you know, there's probably about 30 chapters in each of those. So we will get going tomorrow with Leviticus 7. I love you, and I will see you then. Keep on praying. Pray for me. I'm praying for you. Love you. Good night.